Hi everybody, and welcome to part one of my Making a Mermaid tutorial. And this is basically just the background of the base bead and all the elements that I've used in the background um, to get the base bead before you actually put on the mermaid. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how to come up with your own unique design. It's great to come up with your own design in glass. And basically this mermaid bead is my own unique design that I came up with back in 2005, 2006. And it started out as an actual drawing. So you think of an idea and you picture it and write it down or draw it. And you can see I have really awful drawing capabilities, but <laughs> I do much better in glass. But once you get a concept down, you try to figure out how you can actually work it to make the glass work in the way you're imagining in your mind. And so once I had an idea for my mermaid bead be being put on the surface of another bead, I had to figure out, okay, what needs to go down first what needs to be laid down second? And you think of it in little steps, little miniature steps, like, you know, the head's got to go, go on first, and then the body, and then the tail, and then the hair. And, and you try to figure out which way it needs to go on first to make it work without, you know, cracking or ruining your bead. And uh, then you try it, and then you might have to switch things up. I had to do that to get it to come out right. But um, you actually can come out with your own unique design, and I hope to see some of your unique designs in this way. But um, just an FYI on that. And uh, now we'll get started in the actual mermaid bead. And um, this is basically all the different items I will be using while making this mermaid bead. So first of all, I have the hair stringer for the mermaid, which will be, be in actually part two of this video, but I have the hair stringer, and then I have the actual double helix um, with the blue uh, and clear glass that I made in the last video. That'll be in the base bead, and so I'll be using that in this video. So there's that. Then I'm actually using white as the main base or the bulk of the center of the bead. And then I have a skin tone. You can use any skin tone. I'm using just ivory here. And I'm also using that for around the bottom of the bead for like sand or the bottom of the ocean kind of a um, effect. And then I have three transparent, transparent colors. You can use any ocean colors you want, but I like it graduated. So I have aqua, teal, and purple. And then I have a couple of blues, a transparent and an opaque. And then I have stringers that I actually made in my aquarium making video. So if you need uh, details on this of how to make them, you can go to my aquarium bead prep videos and I show how to do those stringers. But I have the seaweed stringer and I have the barnacle cane stringer which I actually cut into little chips for little barnacles that are going to be put on the top surface of this bead. And so besides that, I also have silvered ivory, which I don't show here, but I have silvered ivory that I'm going to actually use for uh, a moon. I, I put usually a moon on my beads. I like to do that. It's kind of my signature. I put a silvered ivory moon. And then I use this little stringer of silver glass and this is for the tail. So I basically have a big white bead, which is a little tapered at the bottom. And this is about a two inch tall bead. These are not small beads, they're pretty big. And I have it tapered at the bottom a little bit because I'm gonna put the ivory on there for like the little sand or the bottom of the ocean. It kind of represents that. And I could have done this with a, a large rod, a regular size rod, but I'm just using the same stringer that I'm going to make my mermaid body with. So I'm just striping that on over the white, and I'm getting it right up to the point where it melds in with the rest of the bead to make it look like a, a continuous barrel shape instead of having it taper down anymore. And so that's what I'm doing here. And you want to make sure you keep the whole bead warm. I'm going through and making sure that white stays warm. And now I'm using my little handy dandy 
dental tool from Arrow Springs. Um, it's like if you see their set, it's like the fourth one from the left on their little uh, 12 piece set, I think it is. And I just love that tool. It's my favorite tool for especially tamping down the glass towards the mandrel when you want to encase like I just did there with the ivory. So now I'm just going to even this out and it's a little uh, glary because of the white reflecting the light. It'll get a little bit better, I'm hoping, in this video, but the white is just like overpowering and blurring out um, the rest of the color there. So it's kind of hard to see the surface. But I'm just smoothing that out. And there is the white with the ivory at just at the very bottom. You don't need a lot of it. So that's how I start that. And now I'm going to do some trailing. And if you've ever done trailing, uh, you know how this is done. But basically you just heat up your rod of glass and you just touch it barely to the surface. And you pull out thin stringers and you just whip around your bead um, to create very thin stringers in, in just hodgepodge directions. It doesn't matter which directions they go. It's just to add a little variance to the background. And I have a couple little dots that are kind of big from when I first pushed them down there and I'm pulling those off. That's not a big deal. You can leave them there or not. A lot of this is going to be covered by the mermaid. So a lot of this isn't even going to be seen, but I still like to have a really nice background in my beads. So it's kind of hard to see there, but I will zoom in and slow down um, when the rest of this trailing is finished. But I'm going to do the same thing with the other blue I have. This is electric blue from CIM. And I'm going to trail this around. And this is actually a stringer of blue. So I could have actually just wrapped around the full stringer, but I wanted it a little skinnier. And so I'm trailing the stringer also. But I still get a little bit of thickness there with that one. And it doesn't really matter. It's whatever you want in the background. I just like a little bit of variance in my background. Just so it's not all just solid color. But if you want solid color, you can do that too. And so I'm just melting this in. Make sure you warm up the whole bead, keep the whole bead warm. That's uh, one of the big issues with having a full, huge bead like this. And so there's like the stripes, you can kind of see them there. I tried to adjust the gamma a little bit because it is so bright, that white. And so now I'm gonna do my background encasement. So you can use whatever you want. Um, I'm using dark ivory or dark aqua here, sorry. And um, I could have encased this whole thing in dark aqua. That would have been fine. I like a little variance and graduation in my beads. So I'm actually going to put three colors on the background. And so I'm starting with the aqua. Now I'm going to dark turquoise. And I'm going to make my first layer overlap part of the last layer of aqua there. So it'll be kind of blended and do like three wraparounds. I'm doing like three ro rotations of each color. And I want it a little bit thinner on that dark aqua, so I'm actually gonna marver that down a little bit on an angle. As you can see, I'm pushing it on an angle so that it kind of pushes that aqua over a little bit so that I can have a little bit of purple and aqua overlapping with not having the aqua too thick. So that's what I was doing there. And so now I'm going to add my dark purple glycine. I believe it's a fetch ray. It's 039 dark purple. It makes a really nice rich purple. One of my favorite purples because it's a nice purple purple, not a red purple. Um, it's, it's more of a blue purple or in, or in the middle, basically. So I'm going to add a little extra to the end so that I can actually push that down with my dental tool. And you could see that there. It's kind of sticking out and I'm going to push it down. And this is why I really love this dental tool. You could just push it right down to the mandrel because it's so thin. And remember if it gets too hot, put it in water, cool it down again, 
because you don't want the glass fusing to your tools. So I just tap it all the way around and now I'm going to shape it a little bit more. So I have this sped up now so you don't have to watch all of this. Um, I'm adding a little bit more ivory. I don't have to worry about the edge because I already have that encased. I just need to add a little more bulk so that the bead is like an even barrel all the way across. It was a little, there was a little less glass on the edge so I couldn't get a nice even rounded barrel shape on that end. So I added a little more ivory. And so now I'm just going to melt it in and shape it. So I want to keep it fairly even and fairly round. I mean, it doesn't have to be totally perfect because I'm going to add some dichro to this and also the double helix stringer that I made in the last video. I'm going to be adding it into this bead. So I'm not done yet. And so there's a little close up of the graduation. It's warm, so you can't really see the total effect, but that's what it looks like so far. And now I'm going to add the dichro. So you want to determine which side is the dichro side and which is the glass. And you do not want to put the dichro directly in the flame. So I have it way back in my flame and I'm going to heat it and heat it. And as it gets a little warmer, I can bring it a little closer into the flame until it starts bending. So you hold it kind of like on an outward angle and I'm only heating the glass side. The dichro is not actually getting in the flame and you see it bends there. It's ready to attach now. So I need to heat my bead first and then start attaching it. And I roll it on backwards from the actual way I normally roll glass. I roll it backwards so that the dichro never gets into the flame. And I'm just going to burn it off there at the edge. And there's the dichro on there. So now I'm going to speed up again because I'm just going to smoosh down this clear glass, which is on the top. And I'm, I have the bead underneath the flame. I'm just trying to heat the clear. I'm not trying to touch the dichro at all. And I'm trying to smoosh out that clear and push it in either direction to totally cover the clear. And the clear touches down on my aqua and my teal instead of actually having the dichro, you know, come up through the clear. You want to make sure the dichro is totally encased and that clear spreads out over it. And uh, just a note with dichro also, not all dichros are alike. There are some dichros that are a lot more sensitive to the flame. And so even if you have it encased like this and none of the flame is touching it, they can still burn out. So you just have to be a little bit careful with some dichros. Other ones are really resilient. Um, I like CBS dichroic. And um, I mean, they're really good. And that's what I was using here, I believe. So now I'm just adding some of that double helix stringer and I'm adding it right on the edge of the dichro. So it'll kind of go along with it. And I'm going around, all looping around both loops of the dichro, wrapping itself around. And so basically my di dichro should be safe now because it's totally encased. But like I said, not all dichros are created equal. So you just have to be careful of what you purchase. And so there's my dichro. And you can see it has that little pattern defect in it. And it was kind of hard to see the double helix there because it's a light blue on a blue background. So that was kind of difficult. But since I have the raised dichro and that little double helix stringer, I want to actually even out the bead 
and I don't want to smush all that double helix stringer especially down so it distorts so I'm adding a little bit of clear glass around the rest of my bead to raise it up to the same height as the dichro and the double helix so I'm just adding it on the purple and the top of the teal color and then on towards the bottom right by the ivory but I'm not actually putting it on the ivory because I do want that weird you know black or brown line you get between aqua and ivory you get that dark line if you really don't want that dark line then I would suggest actually covering your ivory with a very thin layer of clear at least the edge of it before you put down your aqua so having a barrier and then you won't have that uh, little dark black brown color line but uh, I kind of like it. it it adds a little more distinction and so now I'm just uh, I sped the video up again and I'm just shaping it away just shaping it until I get a really nice barrel shape that's even from top to bottom I shape a little more at the top because it doesn't taper enough yet and basically there's the shape I'm kind of looking for it's not totally straight but that's okay and as I was looking with the light you could see the light at the top of my screen there as I was looking closely I noticed I had a bubble in the purple I had a fairly large bubble if it was small I wouldn't worry about it but it was fairly large so I'm gonna try to get that out and I did get it out I removed it but as I melted that purple back in the white had come up to the surface like through the bubble or because I pinched it and so I'm gonna add just a little more purple where those um, lighter dots were because it looked like the white was really showing through and so I'm just going to add a little more purple to the top to cover that up so you can always fix especially little mistakes like a bubble or what have you you can kind of always fix that and like I said most of this bead especially from the front is going to be covered up and so I'm going to twist little waves in the ivory now and you saw I removed a fairly thick, it's like a two millimeter stringer of clear. And I actually picked off the end there to prep it for twisting. And basically I don't have to put that back in the flame again because it's already still a little bit warm. Um, because you want a hard stringer. So you want it maybe a little warm. You don't want it to shock and crack. You want it a little warm, but you want it totally resilient and hard, like solid glass before you twist and so I have that sitting on the side and I'm just shaping a little more before I start twisting and there's the bead so now I'm gonna twist and I turn down my flame for this because I want just a certain section of glass that I heat I push it in just barely and then I twist and the ivory twists with the aqua and I'm putting it right in the center of the two right in the center of the aqua and the ivory and then I twist and twist as much as you want until it looks nice that you know where you like it and then you just break it off you snap it off and this is how you make twists in beads and so I'm just gonna speed this up and I'm gonna do multiple I did like six or seven twists all the way around the bead and so you can either just let it sit and cool and then snap it off or you can actually blow on it which I do sometimes I blow on it if it's not cooling fast enough I blow right at the juncture between the stringer and the and the bead to cool it down faster and then I can snap it off which I did right there <laughs> and so I'm twisting actually in where the dichro is also and twisting some of that dichro I didn't have to do that but just an FYI that you can 
But when you twist into something like that, that's deeper down, you actually have to push your stringer down further to actually grab that glass and move it. And so for the center, I had to plunge my stringer in a little further to make it twist. So just an FYI there, you can twist things that are underneath layers of clear. It just uh, takes a little more plunging, so you have to heat it a little bit more. So now I'm just finishing up the shaping until I have it even enough that I think it's ready to flatten. And once this bead is all flattened, so there's my twisted bead. You can see those little light spots are where I twisted that dichro. And you can actually see more of the white that's underneath. So it kind of lightens it up. So that's another FYI. Whatever is at the bottom, you might expose. And if you don't want to expose that, uh, just keep that in mind when you're twisting. So just a little more shaping. And then I'll have the final base bead ready to receive the mermaid, which will be in part two of this video. So when I flatten, I look directly down at my bead and then I look at the side and I smash from both angles looking directly down so I know I have my mandrel evenly in the center of the bead and I have the bead as thick or as thin as I want it. This is a fairly thick um, like coin shaped bead or, or smashed barrel bead. It's fairly thick. It's a pretty big bead. It's like about two inches tall, if not a little bit more, maybe two and a quarter. So it's a fairly large bead to receive these mermaids. And so now I'm just trying to get all the chill marks out, round it out a little bit on the surface area, but then also trying to get the two sides to be the same curvature and uh, sticking out or in um, at the same distance. And there is my base bead, ready to receive the mermaid. And hopefully you could see the dichro. It's kind of hard to see, but the really glimmery, shiny part, that's the dichro. So I hope you see me in part two. Thanks for watching.